The United States is going to stay in the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, despite President Donald Trump's objections, says U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley, claiming Iran is not in breach of the agreement. Iran agreed to limit parts of its peaceful nuclear program in exchange for removal of all nuclear-related sanctions against the country. Former President Barack Obama hailed the deal as one of his greatest achievements. But Trump has described the agreement as the worst deal ever negotiated. The Republican president has been desperately trying to scrap the agreement, which prevents him from adopting more hardline policies against that Islamic Republic. Trump has accused Iran of committing multiple violations of the agreement, a claim repeatedly rejected by the International Atomic Energy Agency, America's European allies and even officials within his own administration. Trump's words show a shift towards a more confrontational position toward Iran over its civilian nuclear and ballistic missile programs. In his speech, President Trump referred for the first time to the Arabian Gulf and not the Persian Gulf, as the US administration has previously called the region. The change in wording may be a deliberate attempt to provoke Iran. He has also allowed more massive quantities of arms sales to the Saudi Kingdom, which is committing war crimes in the neighboring Yemen, according to a new report. Why is the American president worried about Iran's nuclear activity while ignoring Israel's undeclared nuclear weapons? And what impact has the United States arms sales to Saudi Arabia had on peace? Simple questions with important answers. Let's start with this question. Is Donald Trump's hostile approach to foreign policy leading the way for another global war? We asked the American public. You ask tough questions. I hope not. Uh, I don't think so. Donald Trump is insane. Totally insane. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, he's putting us in great jeopardy. Um, yes, definitely. <laughs> Um, and I, I mean, um, I think what he's doing is he's kind of like speeding outside of what I guess like the country believes and it's a little bit unpredictable and when it's unpredictable like that, other people will react in unpredictable ways. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's not going to be good for our nation. <laughs> no. Uh, unfortunately, I believe so. Yes, I would think so. I think we can see from how his statements towards North Korea, towards statements among members of his own party, towards Israel, towards everything that he says, uh, especially his stance with Russia, I think we can see that he's definitely presenting a destabilizing influence on the global world order, and that's something we got to be concerned about. I hope not. No, he's not doing anything hostile. He has no hostile approach. Absolutely. I don't think so. I think he knows what he's doing. Yes, definitely. I really don't think it's a hostile approach. I think he's showing that he's a leader and he's not weak, and we have come off weak for so long. We really need that to, de to show people that we're not going to be bullied anymore. I support him 100% on that. Uh, somewhat, yeah. I think so. Well, I think Donald Trump's uh, position when it comes to foreign policy and when it comes to the U.S. interests abroad, certainly it seems very hostile. It seems to be one that could lead to another global conflagration. Uh, however, I think that Donald Trump's administration is also filled, on the one hand, is filled with generals. Uh, but at the same time, there's people around Donald Trump who perhaps want to rein him in a little bit when it comes to issues like North Korea. Trump, of course, stood up at the United Nations and said, we're not going to hesitate to destroy the entirety of the country, I mean, which really is saying openly on the world stage that I'm willing to commit massive war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, so I think that there's people, though, in the Trump administration, such as his secretary of state, Rex Tillerson, who actually says, no, we should continue negotiations with North Korea. Um, people even like his defense secretary, Mattis, who is a war hawk, they're also saying perhaps we should engage in negotiations or we should stay in the Iran nuclear deal. So there seems to be some tension between Trump and those around him in his administration.
Some people would say World War III has already happened. Since the end of World War II, the United States and Britain has led a global campaign of genocide across the world. Now, Donald Trump's language is certainly less duplicitous than his predecessors, who were in the business of destroying countries also, who plunged the United States into war because their economy is reliant on these very wars. So I think Donald Trump is becoming a bit of a boogeyman figure. He's certainly dangerous, but at the end of the day, he's no different to his predecessors. Israel has undeclared nuclear weapons that are not regulated by any peace treaties. Yet Donald Trump seems only concerned about Iran's nuclear activity. Why, in the American public's opinion, is this the case? I don't hazard a guess as to how his mind operates. I don't know. There's no figuring what Donald Trump is thinking. I think he does it because he doesn't like that Obama did that, and he's just trying to get rid of whatever Obama did. Um, as I said, he's not the smartest president <laughs> that we had, uh, so um, I really don't know what his thoughts are. Uh, I think no one knows what he's thinking in his head. So. No, that's not true. He's concerned about the overall peace of the, and security of the United States. Um, probably because he's a warmonger and a fascist and uh, doesn't understand uh, anything about global politics and uh, doesn't care for people. I think he's supposed to be concerned about Iran nuclear activity, also about Korea nuclear activity. It's his job to be concerned and to do something about it. I feel like he picks and chooses which areas of the world he wants to declare as evil without really thinking about the implications for what that could lead to. Yeah, so Trump is very supportive of Israel, it seems like, and not supportive of countries like Iran or other Middle Eastern, more um, Muslim countries, it seems like. Um, I'd say that's been a pattern of U.S. history in the last, you know, since um, World War II. So part of the reason is I would say that he is following U.S. patterns, but it's also, you know, like personal opinions. Like his daughter is Jewish, his daughter's husband's Jewish. Um, I think he sees Israel not to be a threat, you know, not to use nukes and weapons of mass destruction in a bad way, and he does see Iran to do that. Okay. Why he sees that, I, I, I don't know. Okay. Well, I think nothing really shows the hypocrisy of the United States on the world stage more than its relationship with Israel and the fact that Israel is able to possess vast amounts of nuclear weapons uh, to be the only nuclear superpower in the Middle East, and yet a country like Iran, which was trying to develop uh, nuclear capacity for peaceful purposes, in fact, they've said many times that there was no desire to actually produce nuclear weapons, comes under attack from the United States. Uh, I think that you can see Israel as a U.S. military based in the Middle East. I think it's an extension of U.S. imperialism, it's an extension of uh, colonialism, and it really functions to serve the interests of Washington and the Pentagon uh, in that particular region. And I think that the, the primary goal, really, of, of using Israel is to uh, fight against any independent or nationalist governments in the, in the region that refuse to play ball with U.S. imperialism. Well, Iran is a country that stands against U.S. imperialism what it calls the Great Satan. Israel is essentially an aircraft carrier for the United States and Britain in the region. It's cheaper than having a permanent aircraft carrier base there. So people bang on about how much money in aid the United States gives to Israel each year. It's nothing in the grand scheme of things. It's there because it allows them to wage war across the Middle East. Trump signed a multi-billion dollar arms deal with Saudi Arabia on his first visit to the country. How have such actions contributed to peace and stability in the region? Here's the American public's view. I think in general that the U.S. should attempt to get along with whomever we can and uh, anywhere and everywhere. It's been going on for years, hasn't it? It's been going on for years. Britain's been selling them to years, for years to Saudi Arabia. Everyone has. Everyone. I don't think it does contribute to peace, but as long as I don't use them aggressively, then no problem. I don't think Saudi Arabia contributes anything to peace. Uh, the Wahhabis uh, and their philosophy, I think, uh, have been a threat throughout the world for many years uh, since the country was created in 1937. Would that be right? I think so. 
I'm not sure how to answer that, mm -hmm. but I hope that people around the world know that Donald Trump doesn't speak of the views of all Americans, that um, I would think the majority of people in America are much more interested in mm -hmm. peace and, and getting along with people of all nations and religions. Um, and I think it's possible that we can all do that. Well, I think it's an incredibly destabilizing force because when you supply a country like Saudi Arabia that has known human rights violations and is undergoing considerable war crimes in Yemen and we're funding them and providing all sorts of military aid, I think that's a very much a destabilizing force in the region and I hate to see that. And the Middle East already has enough problems and it, it, it's unfortunate that we continue to pile them on. I don't think it contributes to peace or stability at all. Um, I think they should be worried uh, less about buying weapons and more about peace. Uh, by weapons, I don't think it's peace anywhere. Uh, so just by selling more weapons and stuff with weapons doesn't make it peace anywhere. So it's just crazy. I trust our national leaders to have the safety and security of the United States interests at heart, and I would trust that that was the right move to make at the time that he made it. I don't think they do at all. They do not contribute to peace or stability in the region. Well, I must say I don't know what to answer to this question. That's a difficult one because um, having lived in the Middle East, um, you have a slightly different view as to the stabilization of the world. Um, that I'm not too sure of. I've heard mixed and I've only heard bits and pieces. A lot, I think, has been um, edited out for us to hear. So I'm sure he's a smart man. He's got good guys behind him giving him information. I'm sure he's, he's going by his, I'm sorry, his, um, not advocates, mm -hmm. his people that are advising him <clears throat> that knows what's going on. So I, I do support him. I think if they're signing a deal, that at least helps things. Um, but I feel like it should be for, you know, a lot more groups than just one. Um, I feel like, like I said kind of before, how he picks and chooses. I think that kind of attitude is what really kind of destroys any stability. I don't really know why he would do that. Because, like, Saudi Arabia, um, like, I wouldn't say, like, like obviously they're wealthy and they could st help stabilize the region. But, you know, they have many laws that we don't agree with. Um, so it seems like he's just, he does, maybe would do a deal with them and not a country like Iran or Iraq, basically because like wealth. Well, they don't contribute to peace and stability. In fact, they do nothing but destabilize the region. Um, Saudi Arabia is another glaring example of the hypocrisy of the U.S. when it claims to fight for freedom and democracy and you have this uh, kingdom, this very reactionary regime in place in Riyadh, uh, which, among other things, is involved in the destruction of the country of Yemen at the present moment. And that's a, a, a war that the United States has blood on its hands in as well. Obama had blood on his hands and Trump has blood on his hands uh, when it comes to selling vast quantities of weapons to Saudi Arabia that then get used in these conflicts, uh, as well as also funneling arms to uh, Wahhabi and Salafi groups fighting the war in Syria. So you, you can see really the, the United States, by supporting Saudi Arabia, supports some of the most reactionary and regressive social and political forces in the entire region. So it does nothing to contribute ultimately to uh, stability. Its, its goal is actually the destabilization of the region. The United States is not interested in peace and stability. It's in the business of breaking up countries. Certainly in the Middle East, they want, if you will, a massive number of emirates rather than actual states. They want to demolish states. They want to partition them, fracture them, as we see in Syria today, and Iraq. That is what they're in the business of doing. So the Saudis, which are their junior partner, they are propped up by the British and the Americans. They are essentially just a cash cow for the United States. They don't actually possess any real power. They are a colony, a modern day colony. In the first eight months of 2017, the Trump administration increased its bomb, missile and ammunition deliveries to Saudi Arabia, sales worth over a billion dollars, up by more than 100% versus the same period in 2016. And the military ambitions of America don't end there. While Britain, France and Russia have about 30 foreign bases combined, the United States still maintains nearly 800 military bases in more than 70 countries and territories abroad. The US has military bases throughout the Middle East. 
Does this destabilize the region? We ask the American public. Um, I don't think it destabilizes. I kind of think it's sort of like a comfort. It makes it comforting that you have a U.S. presence there. If they're not being active and if it's just a presence there, it kind of creates a safe haven for Middle Easterners to go to and they, you know, it doesn't feel as there's a threat. There doesn't have to be war for there to be a presence in the country. So. Probably not. I think it's, uh, personally, my personal opinion is uh, I, I I think we should attempt to minimize empire building as much as possible, uh, but I don't make such decisions. I think it, I don't think it destabilizes, I think it just gives a shield of protection should it be needed against um, some enemies of the US and probably its allies. We need bases throughout the world, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, if some are in the Middle East, it just makes it more convenient and less time to um, react to a situation. Um, yes, I, it is intrusive to have mil militia in someone else's space. And I mean, like the United States, although people can think that we're b bringing peace to these places, isn't really the reality of it. And honestly, sometimes it's more harmful than it is helpful to have these forces mm -hmm. abroad and yeah. But we should, I mean, we, how, that being said, I don't say that we should like keep all our resources to ourselves. Like, I think it's worth um, stepping up in like cases where I don't, like for humanitarian causes where like human rights are um, infringed and marginalized, so. I think that's uh, a more complex answer than yes or no. In some ways, yes, in some ways, no. Um, I think that it's a necessary thing for the sort of flux that a lot of the Middle East is in right now from uh, Syria to all sorts of countries in the region. I would like to see us pull back our presence once things start to get uh, more styled out because I do think that the United States and the Middle East are, uh, are diametrically opposed in a lot of ways. But for now, I think it's important. But later, we'll see. I don't think so. I mean, we're there to help people. If they don't want us there, they'll kick us out. It depends on what they're doing in the bases, like if they use it as a weapon to the other countries or if they appease in the other countries. So. No, not at all. I think it protects the interests of the United States and the people that are there, our servicemen who are there. I do. I think the troops should come home and we should stop interfering in uh, foreign affairs of other countries. No, it helps keep peace. I'm not a big fan of having the bases everywhere. I know that there's reasoning behind it. There's a lot of upset through there. so. I think it's where it's necessary right now, okay. where everything's just so unstable. I think we really do need to be there right now. I don't think so. I think um, too much influence somewhere where they don't need it is just going to cause more turmoil for everyone. I think the United States, anywhere that it has military bases, and that's really on all corners of the globe, it contributes to destabilization. I mean, we can just look at what's happening right now, perhaps far away from the Middle East, but if you look at the U.S. position and posture towards Venezuela, it's very, very similar. And it, of course, uses its military outposts, whether that's in Colombia or other countries uh, in which it has good relationships with, to destabilize those, those governments. Uh, so, you know, if the U.S. has military bases in Bahrain or in Qatar, are, which is also very interesting because Trump has, in that dispute, uh, come out on the side of Saudi Arabia, but the other uh, forces within his government want to maintain good relationships with both Saudi and Qatar. Uh, so it, certainly the United States, their, their goal and their objectives in not only the region, but globally is the destabilization uh, really for the interests of monopoly capital and for the interests of imperialism. And it does nothing to benefit the working people of the U.S. It, it only benefits those uh, who possess all of the wealth and all of the power in U.S. society. Well, the United States are currently in more than 150 countries around the world. That's the United States troops. So what they're in the business of is protecting their economy. In Niger recently, four U.S. troops were killed. Why were they there? They were protecting their looting of the uranium. It was Barack Obama who basically said to France, you can recolonize your former colonies as long as you're subordinate to U.S. interest. So the troops in the Middle East, everywhere in the world, are there to protect U.S. domination. The U.S.'s actions in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya have destabilized the Middle East. 
So is the United States really in a moral position to make judgments on Iran? We put that to the American public. Probably not. It was the leader of the free world and the, the, the biggest superpower in the world. They have to make decisions. Sometimes they're not always wrong, sometimes they're not wrong, but I think somebody's got to make them. So that's how, that's how you deal with them, how you interpret them, isn't it? How you deal with them. The United States, well, are they, I think most Iranians probably want peace as much as most Americans. Um, the United States should never have invaded Iraq. There was no reason for it. It was a false premise. Uh, our moral authority has uh, diminished over the years, let's put it that way. No, it is not. Um, I think, again, like people are entitled to their beliefs and systems, and like until people are getting hurt, I don't think that, um, or uh, honestly, there's the chance that someone will get hurt. We shouldn't infringe or make opinions or favoritism different belief systems than others. Um, definitely not. I think everyone's equal in that department, and um, the United States is as equal in the blame for the des destabilization. Uh, no, not if they know what the information is about in Iran or the consequences or what's happening. Right. Uh, but I don't feel that they're making any good stuff with it. Okay. <laughs> so. I don't think that that's the case at all. I think the United States are in those areas uh, simply to protect the interests of the United States. And if you remember, that's where the 9-11 hijackers came from, that region of the country. So uh, I think it's uh, by all means the right thing to do. Not at all. Nobody is, is in a position to make moral judgments. Um, yeah, I don't think they should have had it in the first place. And I think with the issues with terrorism and stuff, and he's really trying to cut down on that. Mm -hmm. I, I think we really do need to be there. I think this needs to happen right now. I feel like yes and no. They can at least help when needed, but I think going too far and bringing in like military things like that um, would be overkill and I think would stir things up more than it should and also just be a lot of money spent. There's no type of moral or, or ethical leg that the United States can stand on when it comes to judging Iran for anything. And we can have a separate conversation about Iran and its uh, motivations in the region. But when it comes to the United States and when it comes to Trump, for example, saying that he wants to decertify the uh, so-called Iran nuclear deal, it's, it's absolutely absurd. And you, you cite the example of Libya, which I think is an important one because Libya was a country that was destroyed by NATO bombs. It was a country destroyed by the United States, Britain, and France. And now we see it today, six years after that war, uh, what was the richest country in all of Africa now is completely plundered and it has no viable government. We see Iraq, which is a state that's been fragmented, a state that now you can see the sectarianism and nationalism running uh, rife throughout society. Um, you can, there's countless other examples of societies and countries which the U.S. has uh, invaded or intervened in for what it calls humanitarian reasons, but they actually have have nothing fundamentally to do with freedom or democracy or, or any type of humanitarian purpose whatsoever. Well, the United States is not in the business of peace and stabilization. Saudi Arabia, which is propped up by the British and Americans, is a colony, a neo-colonial entity, as are most of the Gulfy states. The Saudi deal is essentially a cash cow for the United States. They prop up the US economy the same way that Bahrain and Qatar prop up the British economy. But it's not a sense that the US or Britain are clients of those countries. Those countries are clients of the US and Britain. They are the junior partners in these relationships. President Donald Trump has repeatedly refused to certify or endorse the nuclear agreement with Iran. His language has been overtly provocative. He has used confrontational phraseology in a series of public statements regarding Iran. In defiance of other world powers, President Trump has said he might ultimately terminate the agreements which were made with Tehran. If he succeeds, that would end a landmark victory of multilateral diplomacy and replace it with active provocation. When so many people hope for peace, Donald Trump seems happy to serve up all the ingredients that could lead to war.